Before now, there had been numerous two-part episodes in Star Trek. The two parts of the Maquis we just covered illustrate that. But generally speaking, feature-length episodes, episodes specifically made to be shown as one single double-long episode, were reserved for introducing or closing out a series. Way of the Warrior had been the first exception, except that it was partially meant to reintroduce DS9 to the audience with the addition of Worf and the rejiggering of the status quo, so it was, in a sense, a second pilot to kick off this new DS9. Dark Frontier, however, was created specifically to be a Voyager movie, not a two-parter, not an adjustment to the series, their full-length, large-scope television film. The previous year, The Killing Game, was a two-parter, with both parts being aired on the same night during sweeps, and it had done so well in the ratings that it was justifiable to try this experiment. The first half was directed by Cliff Bowl, who directed both parts of The Best of Both Worlds. This was his last Star Trek episode. The second half was directed by newcomer Terry Windell, who would go on to direct Lifeline, which we've already covered, and Survival Instinct, which would again serve as a significant Seven of Nine character episode. And I don't mean one where we suddenly tack a stupid human lesson onto any old episode and treat it like it's hers, but one specifically intended to explore who she was. Dark Frontier is a similar episode, one that fully explores how Annika Hansen wound up becoming Seven of Nine. As such, this episode gives me an opportunity to more thoroughly discuss her throughout these three parts. As I've said previously, I went into Voyager pumped. I wanted to like this show. The problem was, it wasn't willing to meet me halfway by being good. I watched it through the first season, and it felt like it was stumbling, but I stuck with it. Halfway through the second season, I finally just gave up. I continued with DS9, but I just left Voyager cold turkey and never thought twice about it again. It wasn't until May of 97 that I returned briefly, and even then only at the prompting of my former roommate, who was amused by Janeway making a decision so bad that even Neelix questioned it. That was in Scorpion. It was only half a year after first contact, so the idea of checking out a Borg episode was appealing, even if it was on Voyager, so I decided to stick around for the second half before leaving again. Because I hadn't been following the show, I had no idea there was going to be a cast change, so I was surprised to discover the female drone alive at the end of Scorpion. I watched the gif just to see what would happen to her, and then, as planned, left. But later, I happened to flip by when the raven was on, and that was when Seven convinced me to give the show another chance. She had very appealing qualities. And since the people who ran this show either had no soul or lost it in a tragic accident, I have to explain that this is not because of the feminine assets that are on display. On the contrary, I'd have preferred she spent the first season wearing the Borg suit, not necessarily full makeup, but at least keeping much of the suit and implants and having removed them as a conscious step forward on her part rather than some kind of imposed change upon her. Let's get into the episode itself. A Borg probe ship has found Voyager and is moving in for assimilation. Not a cube, not a sphere, no, it's the rarely seen Almond Joy model. This little one is actually of comparable power to Voyager, so it's an even fight for once. Did you hear 3 was turned into a can opener? Can opener, huh? Well, he deserved that promotion. Voyager knocks down the ship's shields and then beams over a photon torpedo. This drone does the important job of staring at the blinking lights until it explodes. I suppose he's trying to disarm it, and while I'm not a super genius cyborg collective, it seems to me it might have been quicker to just beam it away yourself, certainly faster than Speedy Gonzalez here. The Voyager crew is surprised that their torpedo actually managed to blow something up, and everything needs to now be checked over. Survivors. None. Debris status. I'm fine, thanks for asking. Being so powerful as to blow up a Borg ship on accident makes Janeway feel like luck smiling on her, so she orders them to start salvaging what they can from the remains. Now this is how I prefer the Borg. In pieces. Didn't you say the same thing about the Kazon, the Vidians, and the Krenim? And uppity first officers, go find my last one if you need proof. They start picking through stuff. Look, Chakotay, I've wanted one of these all my life. It's a coffee maker that's also a bong. The doctor is extremely excited about what he's found, an arm. At least I really hope that's an arm. All this is making Chakotay nervous. Maybe I should go to Red Alert and get it over with. Commander. You're about to drop one of your bombshells. Oh, I see. 
All right, before you say anything, first of all, it's a mutant, not a monster. Second, nothing can break those chains. And third, since I only made one, if you kill it, that's technically genocide. And technically suicide. Huh? No, you're the crazy one! Tom and Harry head into the mess hall after it's over to celebrate with some very manly and heterosexual beers to offset their touching and hush words. Tom fumbles his charisma roll as Seven comes in. Oh, I would have loved to have seen the look on their faces. Boom! We were only trying to disable them. They were drones, Harry. Mindless automatons. We did them a favor. The purpose of this is twofold. As the reminder that most of the drones we're likely to see are just as much victims as anyone else, and that Seven is still separated from the crew to some degree. In fact, she's dressed like that doesn't help. She scans through some of the data that they got from the wreckage and discovers where nearby ships are, including a damaged sphere. What well, Janeway figures a good way to continue to spread the values of the Federation is to board other people's ships and steal their technology. So, for those of you keeping score, buying technology on the black market to get home is unacceptable. Stealing it is perfectly fine. It's the Janeway way. Also, am I the only one that finds it ironic that on this DVD were our heroes, the enlightened members of the Federation who follow Federation principles and do not question their decision to perform piracy, has an anti-piracy warning on it. Paramount cares more about internet piracy than actual piracy. Janeway christens the plan Operation Fort Knox, having Tom explain that Fort Knox was a place so secure no one ever broke in. Well, what better name than one implying certain failure, huh? What were your backup plans, Janeway, huh? Operation Chernobyl? Operation Titanic? Operation Enterprise's fifth season? Chicote plans to create holodeck simulations for practice, and Torres to use, quote, monkey tricks to mask their engines, but Starfleet might not approve. This is no time for protocol. Get started. You've been stranded on the other side of the galaxy for five years. How long did it take for you to figure that out? Jimmy also decides to take Seven aside afterwards and discuss the Raven. We haven't really looked at that episode specifically, but all you really need to know for our purposes is that that was the ship that brought Annika and her parents here until she was assimilated. She wants Seven to look over all the notes they left behind to see if there's any info to help them in their piracy. Seven thinks they're not going to be much help, and it is a bit difficult to argue with someone who's half robot now because they screwed up. I don't mean to pry, but is it true your parents were studying the Borg? Yes. The Hansons were exobiologists. Fascinating. They must have been very courageous. Yeah, right up until someone was grafting metal fibers onto their seven-year-old's daughter's spine. Do you have anything more to add, Prairie Dog, or can I get back to work? The pad triggers a flashback of her father talking about them planning to leave to go looking for the Borg. Uh, this was more than a decade before Q Who, so the Borg were limited to rumors, reports from the Elorian refugees Scotty saved, and the notes of Dr. Phlox, which were incomplete since he was gunned down by Breen assassins. We're not sure exactly, but we think they might look a lot like us, but with technology inside their bodies. Cybernetic? Boy, she's got a good vocabulary for a four-year-old. We soon see her on board the Raven, lamenting to her parents that she can't sleep, but it's interrupted when a cube appears. Field magnitude 2.9, Terra Cochran's in rising. Annika, bed. But I said I can't sleep. Yeah, piss off, kid. The cube scans them, but since their ship is small and rather primitive, they're ignored. Wow, that's fortunate. Hey, you know what sounds like a great idea? Following it! That won't end badly. Okay, e easy to joke about. They didn't really know what they were dealing with here. Now we know better. Anyway, Seven's yanked back to the present, and they find a Borg sphere. Hey, you know what sounds like a great idea? Following it! That won't end badly! I do like Cliff Bowles' handling of the reveal, though. The image of Janeway in the foreground of the scanner with the looming Borg ship harkens back to the one of the cube in Best of Both Worlds. Okay, so they start on a simulation again to practice. Hey, Seven, welcome back. Here three got promoted. Can't open her first class, lucky bastard. The plan is to disable the sensor net, give them two minutes to sneak in, use charges to take down the shields while transport enhancers are set up around the transwarp coil, and that way Tom can beam them out. Yes, Tom. Have there been so many casualties in the transporter room that there are no transporter chiefs left? Harry, Torres, and now the guy busy piloting the ship. Does the transporter chief exist solely to be shot by the bad guys? No wonder O'Brien was anxious to work on DS9. 
So they beam it out, and what? it's not actually connected to anything. No, you had the power of transwarp inside you all the time. You just needed to find it for yourself. Well, they run out of time, and suddenly the Borg can now sense them. And all the drones they were walking past, they have eyes, don't they? Or did the Borg assimilate the umpire's union? Anyway, they were 12 seconds too slow, so the Borg followed them back to Voyager, and there was no way to get the job done any faster. Well, at this rate, they'll never succeed in their plan to rob three casinos in one night. Seven's going to have to go back and check out the Hansen diaries for some answers, but on the way Janeway expresses some concern with her. Seven froze for a moment during the heist, and Janeway suspects that she might have some baggage from all those years of being trapped in the collective. <laughs> Nonsense. Anyway, next scene, and Seven's having a nightmare about Borg, but I'm sure that's completely unrelated. Naomi is in it, concerned that everyone will be assimilated because of the mission, and then starts asking Seven questions. The same questions that little Annika had asked about the Borg before they left Earth, and that an implant emerges. All this is an allegory for the events that led up to her own assimilation. Assimilation. What a word. It doesn't carry emotions like rape, murder... Like the Borg, it's a cold and sterile word for something that's like both. We take you against your will, make you feel powerless, then we violate your mind and your body until you are virtually unrecognizable as you once were, and all that made you, you is destroyed. You're consumed, and now are part of the machine that had consumed you. Seven has escaped from it, but even now the Borg Queen speaks to her in this dream, a warning that Voyager's mission will fail and all of them will be consumed. The price for sparing Voyager is Seven voluntarily sacrificing herself back to the Collective, letting herself be pulled back into the machine. Why me? Because you are unique. We return to Dark Frontier in the midst of a flashback, where we find out that the Raven followed the cube through a transwarp conduit and wound up back in the Delta Quadrant, to explain how the ship got all the way the hell out here. Seven's father's on the cube, watching their every move without them knowing, the same way he got to know Seven's mother, I think. He's able to do it thanks to a special bio-dampener that masks their life signs, and Seven in the present suggests that they use those to avoid detection on the Borg sphere for their special heist. Like everyone else, the doctor praises Seven's parents for how impressive they were, and like everyone else, is surprised that Seven resents spending most of her life as a drone thanks to their mistakes. And because she may have to now voluntarily return to the Borg, well... Obviously, that's a bit of a sore spot for her. But there's no time to waste because Janeway's log informs us that Operation Fort Knox will begin soon, so all departments are ready. Even though none of them will actually be doing anything that matters. Eh, maybe it's just to rub it in. Speaking of Janeway's diplomacy, she talks with Seven for a while. Coffee. You look like you could use some. No. It's a human vice you might want to try one day. Keeps you sharp. Want some smack? How about a whore? Feel like gambling? I played craps against Harry yesterday. He won, so I let him keep his hands. Janeway's decided Seven should stay behind, but Seven is adamant that she must go on the mission. Janeway finally gives in, and the plan begins. Thanks to advanced Heinemann technology, they send out a remote-controlled shuttlecraft, and eventually convince the Borg to assimilate it. While it's being taken, the shields drop so they can beam over, but the words of the Borg Queen cause a pucker moment for Seven. She quickly recovers, and everything goes as planned. The pattern enhancer even works, despite there only being one of them instead of the three to make the triangle they've always used before. On the way out, Seven hears her again and knows what's going to happen, so she announces that she's staying behind. Well, Janeway doesn't want to see Seven get hurt, so well, she points her gigantic gun at her and tells her to come along. But the Borg have now detected Voyager, and Seven is cut off by a force field, so Janeway has to abandon Seven. Hey, is that one of those new phasers? Can I take a closer look? Ah! The other three beam out, and the sphere makes a break for it before Voyager can pursue. The sphere returns to the center of Borg activity, called the Unicomplex, a ginormous structure they've built uh, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Seven's brought to an area where a giant dominatrix Barbie is assembled, and the Borg Queen lowered in place. Seven of Nine is a character who stands between her two natures. Being Borg has given her countless advantages over her shipmates, a frequent immunity to threats such as we saw in one, enhanced physical strength, near-perfect recall, and heightened reflexes. And yet, Seven is clearly superior to other drones specifically because of her humanity. Her individuality compels her to take actions that they wouldn't because they would be inefficient or small, but 
that makes her more adaptive. Seven's neither Borg nor human. She's an alloy of the two. Janeway and the Borg Queen seem to miss that fact. Each sees their nature within her and the need to purge the other, which may explain why Seven resists both of their efforts. A loss of either one diminishes her in the end. The Queen's comments are similar to those of Janeway back in The Gift, only reversed, that the humans have disassembled her in an effort to rebuild her like themselves. She also reveals that allowing Seven to be separated from the Collective by Chakotay was actually something the Borg permitted so that she could learn more about humanity from a Borg perspective. You might have noticed that the Queen looks different than the one we saw in First Contact. This particular model will be seen until the start of Voyager's final season, after which we'll see the return of the original model. It could perhaps be that the Queens are chosen based upon how well they are functioning. With the model from First Contact twice failing in the simple task of assimilating Earth, and the Collective then facing a threat from Species 8472, the Borg may have activated a Queen that was far more aggressive and expansionist in its approach to counter that threat, given that we see the Borg far more often acting in larger numbers now, expanding rapidly even in the wake of their crippling losses, and that she would eventually be replaced when it was clear that her behavior was causing more losses than was permissible for the gains that the Borg were making. After all, she seemed content to hound Voyager from the end of Scorpion until we last saw her in Unimatrix Zero, which <laughs> she blew up a tactical cube for no reason. And then the next time the Borg show up, all that Queen is interested in is for Voyager to just piss off and leave them alone. Back on Voyager, Janeway is checking out Engineering's new baptismal font, guaranteed to get Voyager home through the power of the Holy Ghost. Janeway's impressed with Tora's approach to using the transwarp coil, and Torres confesses that she got some of the ideas when she was digging through Seven's personal database. Janeway orders her not to access personal files without permission, but Torres figures if someone's gone, there's no law that says she can't just root through their stuff. Uh, did you know that Kiss liked to write Twilight fanfics? After repeated attempts to get her to see the point, Janeway finally just orders her to try to stop being a complete bitch. She's having trouble figuring out why Seven would do this. He's had any number of opportunities to leave before now. But never direct access to a Borg vessel. What? What about hope and fear, when they knew the Borg were coming, and it was Seven that managed to get out and help them avoid assimilation? The only way no one would know about that is if Janeway left Seven out and said that she did all the rescuing. Which I suppose would actually explain this, so never mind. She can't be consoled about how her project with Seven just didn't work out. I thought it'd be simple. I already taught the mutant how to love. Was it love had tried to rape a shuttlecraft? Well, if the Galileo didn't look like such a whore, Cascote wouldn't have tried that. Neelix, for God knows what reason, is handling all the Borg stuff. Seven of nine's out, though. It requires a lot of power over 30 megawatts. Should I deactivate it? No. But it uses a lot of power. Hey, toilet brush, you know what doesn't take a lot of power? Me, whooping your ass! She heads back to her ready room to try to figure out if something compelled Seven to leave. After all, the crew has been taught time and time again that the only escape from Janeway's grasp is death itself. Naomi's put together a rescue plan to try to track down Seven, in her own precocious way, but Janeway quickly shoots the plan down. Ah, but what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, Captain Crunch's small heart grew three sizes that day. There are three things to remember about being a starship captain. Keep your shirt tucked in, go down with the ship, And never abandon a member of your crew. I like you, Naomi. You're shorter than me. Perhaps I'll let you rule the world at my side. Want some cigarettes? No, thank you. You should try it. It's another great human vice. To again mirror the gift where Seven had pieces removed while she was sleeping, she now awakens to find the Borg have added some more on. Again, she's indignant, but the Queen assures her that she won't be turned into a drone again. I was critical of the use of the Queen in First Contact, so it might seem contradictory to complement her use with Seven here. The difference between the situations, though, are that her use here is not as an enemy that they oppose, so much as a devil that is meant to tempt Seven. Now, I know that she tried that with Data as well, but that was only part of her function in the film, and what's more, it was a temptation that Data had already faced and passed to betray his friends and ship for new sensations. Seven had wanted to return to the Collective for some time, 
And now the queen is offering ways to pull her back in without having to sacrifice individuality. She's tempting Seven with a chance to keep the part of individuality that she cherishes, which is her unique sense of self, while still having all the positives of the collective, fiends with benefits and all that. But really, look at what happened to Seven since she left. She's forced to tolerate the verbal abuse of Torres. The warp core malfunctions, and Janeway immediately figures it must be Seven sabotaging it. The crew, on the one hand, criticizes her for not acting human, but on the other, constantly calling her Borg, never seeing past the implants. And say what you like about them, but the Borg never turn on their own. The Borg never mistreat each other. The Borg never lie to each other. The Borg never have an ulterior motive. The Borg are free of all prejudices. They don't allow in with suspicion, but bring all in as equals. They'll spare you from pain, protect you from those who would harm you. If the Borg decide that you are too valuable to be lost, Seven, then there are trillions of drones that will stand between you and danger. You lose nothing of what you had and gain back everything that was lost. Why should someone whose home is a cargo bay and sleeps standing up want to resist that? The Queen wants Seven to help them assimilate humanity, but Seven doesn't understand why the memories they've no doubt taken from her while she regenerated wouldn't be enough. You are the only Borg that has ever returned to a state of individuality. What about Locutus? Well, I never liked him. The fellow members of my Unimatrix? Good riddance. Well, there was Hugh. He was malfunctioning. He kept saying third instead of three. And all the other drones on his ship? They worshipped an android. They're dead to me. Uh, then there's that whole colony Chicote ran into. Bunch of hippies. Look, you are unique, Seven. Really, you. You unique. The Queen decides to first work on reminding Seven of their purpose by taking her out for a little assimilation. Kind of a mother-daughter thing. The Queen's yacht is deployed and accompanied by two cubes to assimilate one planet of only a few hundred thousand people. Seven familiarizes herself with the species, and the Queen quizzes her on her observations to determine what action should be taken. Again, showing that the Borg are capable of analyzing something to try to understand it. Seven doesn't want to assimilate anyone, but the Queen hopes to change her mind, so she waits as the opposing ships attack with weapons that are capable of penetrating their shields, which means that the ship that they're on could be destroyed. Now, death doesn't matter to Borg drones, and the Queen will just employ a new body, so the destruction of the ship is irrelevant to everyone except Seven, whose uniqueness will be lost if that happens, so she's finally compelled to devise a counter-strategy. It works, so the opposing ships are now helpless, and assimilation can now begin, and Seven's ordered to go to the assimilation chamber to oversee it personally. We again see the similarities between the Queen and Janeway, as the Queen echoes Janeway's comment about the Hanson files. Janeway had said that she regretted pushing Seven too hard to look at them, and the Queen now says the same thing about the assimilation, and suggests something easier. So Seven goes off to repair some stuff, but in the distance are the screams of the captured people being processed by the Borg. As Seven does her tasks, she hears the sound of people screaming during the assimilation process, but she just tries to ignore it. In fact, much to her own shock, when one of the prisoners makes a break for it, she instinctively grabs him, which is enough time for one of the nearby drones to give him a heaping helping of neck nanoprobes. Thanks a lot, lady. To discuss Seven of Nine requires a bit of explanation, thanks in no small part to her execution on the show. Seven Ranks is one of my favorite characters within the franchise because she brought in something that was sorely needed for Voyager, namely a story arc. It's no coincidence that the other characters from Voyager that I liked also had character arcs throughout the series, growing and evolving. I often spew Venom in the direction of Brennan Braga, but it only has to do with what he does, not anything I have against the man himself, so I can say with honesty that two examples of things he did right were developing the Doctor and introducing and developing Seven of Nine. Hey, I may be an evil bastard, but I give credit where it's due. With Seven, we have the situation of Picard from Best of Both Worlds and Emissary rolled into one, that of being assimilated and then removed from the Collective. We've seen the impact on his character many times since, and that was only for a few days. Here we have someone who has spent most of her life as a drone, scarcely recalling not being one. That issue is now a central part of who she is and amplifies that issue. And that Borg you're protecting. We want her, too. There are many who would enjoy a chance to repay one of them for what they did to us. One thing that intrigues me about a Borg drone is that to be an assimilated Borg is to be both victim and victimizer. You were caught, 
forced against your will to undergo horrific, possibly agonizing transformations to your body, and then had your mind linked to others to eliminate all possible individual thought and think only of other things. From that moment on, you are an expendable tool, nothing more. You, you're irrelevant. You do your tasks and assimilate others just as you were, just as heedless of their pleas as yours were. But suppose you're one of those rare, rare ones that is somehow disconnected from the collective. If you're like Picard, well, you could be lucky and have nothing more than a few personal grudges against you for what you've done. But if you're not so lucky, then you'll be with others who look on you as if you were still a Borg, still one of the ones who caused all that pain and destruction, even though you had nothing to do with it, any more than a drop of water has any say in what the tsunami does. But that doesn't matter, because they hate the Borg for what they've done. They were hurt and want to hurt them back. And they can't hurt the collective but they can hurt you you're an individual now small alone helpless and once again knowing that resistance is futile that you're going to be the victim just like before but they're not quite the same thing say what you will about the borg but they do what they do out of a misguided belief that they're helping you say what you will the borg never hurts you just to hear you scream that's what I liked about Seven of Nine, that background of her and the way it shaped her, the way it provided in its singular nature a multitude of character shades and opportunities. When done right, she has the personal growth of Data, the conflicted nature of Odo, and the dry acerbic nature of Spock. I just wish they hadn't put her in a bloody cat suit. Okay, back to the story. Seven seems to feel kind of bad for what she did, so she disables a drone in the midst of an assimilation so that he and his comrades can escape. Assist me. I am not Borg. I will help you escape. Assist me. Well, okay, I guess. Seven helps them get to a damaged ship where they can hide until the Borg leave and then make a run for it. They nod their appreciation, since they're extras. Seven returns to the Queen's chamber, who is pleased at the new minds that they've now added that will move them closer to perfection. But the up-close and personal sight of all these people who are in this situation because she aided the Borg, has driven Seven to break out some of the nastiest stuff in her arsenal. Sarcasm. Oh, and if this doesn't work, she may even resort to irony. In the midst of her tirade, the Queen senses the escaping ship and knows Seven helped, but when Seven starts pleading for it to be released, she gives in without comment or answer. I'm just feeling enigmatic right now. Back on Voyager during all this, Chakotay's been reading through the notes of the Raven, so we get some more flashbacks. Some more drones were transferred to the cube, and as the Hanses examine one, they realize it was once assigned to work near the Queen. So they tag it like a polar bear and release it back into the wild before its regeneration cycle is up. I thought they needed to regenerate in the alcove. Oh, must work on Wi-Fi or something. Chakotay says the signals picked up from the drone match the ones that Janeway identified pointing at Cargo Bay 2. Janeway figures they should go after Seven and use whatever information the Hansons have to help them achieve that end. I've studied their log entries long enough to realize that as brilliant as the Hansons were, they made a fatal mistake. They became overconfident. We won't make the same mistake. My plan will be to head to the heart of their territory, pass all their ships, storm their throne room, and take Seven away by force if necessary. Overconfidence isn't a problem here. Uh, how's that? Because we have one thing the Borg are powerless against. Something we used to defeat them before. A montage? Hell yes, a montage! Got us through their space, didn't it? Tom, Tuvok, the Doctor, and Janeway take out the Delta Flyer, which kind of <laughs> illustrates how silly this whole thing is, of having the ace pilot also be the only nurse. Let's see, do you go with someone less qualified to fly the ship? Do you not bring the Doctor? Or do you just leave Neelix in charge of sickbay? I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that was exactly what happened. Ooh, that does sound serious. I prescribed some blue stuff. How are you qualified? I have experience treating humanoid life forms. Well, non-humanoid life forms. Well, technically plants. Actually, I just watered some plants when I accidentally set off the sprinklers. Let's see what the blue stuff does. Anyway, our team heads after the sphere, aided by the transwarp coil. Transwarp in four. Three, two. We've crossed the threshold. Oh great, it's salamander sex time. 
On the trip, Janeway starts reading through more of the Hansen journal, where it seems that an accident wound up causing their special cloak shield thingy to fail briefly. An exciting new toy for the Borg to play with, so soon the Raven is left to make a run for it. Little Annika is a bit worried that they're being chased by a ship about the same mass as Manhattan and that hauled them over halfway across the galaxy by accident, but her father says it's all going to be okay. The long entry stops before we find out whether or not Annika was conscious when the Borg plucked her eyeball from her tiny skull. They should have quit while they were ahead. Ten million terraquats of data, three years in the wild. They could have studied the Borg for another three decades and still have barely scratched the surface. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. I agree their methods were unorthodox, but that's been true of most great explorers. Most explorers don't take their four-year-old daughter along for the ride. The doctor's come up with a plan to be able to communicate directly with Seven, and says not to worry if she's part of the hive mind, because only she can hear it. Of course, since her thoughts are part of the hive, and then on the usefulness scale of one to ten, this scores a jackpoint shit, but whatever. It's something to do until they arrive, I guess. Ah, and here we are. Wonder if there's anything to worry about. Looks perfectly safe to me. I give Operation Stupid Plan my full endorsement. A head full! On the Unicomplex, the Queen gives Seven her job, the assimilation of humanity. Physiology inefficient. Below average cranial capacity. Minimal redundant systems. Limited regenerative abilities. All in all, they suck. Your job is to assimilate them at all costs. You intend to detonate a biogenic charge in Earth's atmosphere. It would infect all life forms with nanoprobe viruses. Assimilation would be gradual. You have the resources of a space so vast Voyager can't even cross it in any reasonable length of time. You have enough to just build your own flipping super duper mega city station in deep space for whatever reason. And sure, you lost some ships in the war against Species 8472, but if you have the resources to send two cubes to take out one single planet, why do you need to resort to a probe with a nanoprobe virus to attack Earth? I mean, this is such a Dr. Evil plot. You mean you're not going to attack? No, I'm going to send a highly visible probe into their space and not actually witness their assimilation. I'll just assume it all went to plan. What? Well, why don't you send, like, 20 cubes or something and just assimilate the whole quadrant while you're at it? Seven, you just don't get it, do you? One probe. God, you do this every time! Seven isn't going to help with the assimilation of humanity or with this stupid plan. The Queen puts on the pressure, but she still refuses, so the Queen whips out her trump card. <gasps> Can't open her first class, honey. Aren't you proud? Seven picks up the signal from the Delta Flyer, and, just as predicted, the Queen's able to access her thoughts and learn about it. And because the Delta Flyer is using the cloaking tech Seven's father created, the Borg know all about it and can adapt. So instead, they'll have to use the backup plan. Use the magic armbands and head over there and rescue her. These would be the same armbands that Tuvok himself noted weren't working on the sphere. Oh, forget it. It's not too late to save them. With each passing moment, you make yourself more my servant. The Borgs start making things hard for the Delta Flyer. It's no use. They've locked onto our shield modulators. They're adapting the second we change frequencies. We got a Borg. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Wow, Tom's nightmare in waking moments wasn't this bad. Then again, worse than your nightmares is probably what all crew members expect by now. Janeway's able to use a trick on the armbands to get through the shields and shows up to offer an amazingly lame action hero line. Don't listen to her, Seven. She's irrelevant. God, the only way that could have sounded worse, Captain, was saying, Resistance is whack, yo! And really, this whole part of the episode is so implausible. It's one of those weird times when substituting my homicidally insane Janeway would actually make more sense. How can you hope to defeat the Borg in their own lair? With my army of warrior cobalt tarantulas, I've been training the entire hive to become deadly warriors. 
Tarantulas don't have hives, and normally they don't have wings either, but my job is to fix it whenever nature makes an extraordinarily aggressive and terrifying tarantula and doesn't make it capable of flying up and latching onto your face or have an insatiable hunger for ocular jelly. Will you stop talking if we just give seven back? Who? Janeway threatens to have the Delta Flyer blow up the room they're in, but if those torpedoes can't penetrate a cube, how are they going to get inside the structure they're in and down to the ship the Queen is on board? Or is this room actually removed from the ship and placed in a structurally weak place on purpose? Who knows, there's like five minutes left and our heroes have tech that failed 20 years ago in a souped-up shuttlecraft. I suppose we've got to slide our way to the climax somehow. They can't beam out because of a disruptor field, but Seven could disable it. On the one hand, the Borg Queen wants to turn her into a drone to do whatever she's told, and on the other, Janeway gives her a direct order to do whatever she's told. Choose, Seven. Who do you want to have bossing you around? Seven sides with Janeway, and they soon beam out. Captain, what about... Not now, Seven. They make a break for it, but there's like a gajillion Borg ships around, yet somehow only the Queen's yacht makes a break for it. Captain? Can it, Seven! They head back into Transwarp, the Borg ship shooting at them even in there. But, Captain, your ass is going to assimilate my foot if you don't shut up. Meanwhile, 80% of the crew has succumbed to gangrene. They start to pick up the Delta Flyer, and Janeway quickly fills them in. Now, Seven, what the hell is so important? Can we beam my father off the Borg ship and rescue him, too? Oh, oh, yeah, I suppose. Lock on to Seven's father and beam him over. <clears throat> I'm... I'm sure it's not as bad as it looks. Oh, okay, well, maybe it is. My father! I finally found him, man! Yeah, you really should have spoken up sooner. Thanks to the transwarp, they're able to get 20,000 light years closer to home before it gives up the ghost. Uh, they don't bother trying to copy it because, hey, IP and all that. I found some more of your father. I'll just put it in the bucket with the rest. Happy touchy-feely stuff happens as Janeway orders Seven to regenerate. Ah, freedom. It's so worth it. Post-episode follow-up. Stupid Neelix's moment is him rambling to Seven about his family. Look, she doesn't care about her own. Why do you think she cares about yours? We have a burn, baby, burn for the shuttle assimilated by the Borg. Final score for Dark Frontier is 10 out of 10. There's definitely some logical problems with the story, especially the rescue, which is really very contrived. But I'm willing to cut them a little bit of slack because this week... We really get the sense that they're putting their best out there. The money's clearly up there on the screen to be seen. There's real ambition in the concepts that are pulled off. The image of a passing Borg cube as seen from the tiny Delta Flyer cockpit carries the sheer scope of the threat that they're up against. And, like the shot of Janeway against the sphere from the first part, helps to give this a more big screen feel instead of just another FX shot of the week. It's also helped because in a few scenes, Janeway seems to actually act like a human being, which is always a nice way to shake things up. If I have any criticism, it's only the fact that the character consequences for Seven didn't really seem to be relevant after this. This should have barely been a, uh, as the defining point of Seven of Nine, after which she was a different person, and she really just seemed kind of the same.